Hi everyone, I'm Brandon April, one of the partners at AWM, where we advise people in creating multi-generational flourishing families so that we can solve that shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves financial epidemic. And this is a front row seat with AWM's Chief Investment Officer, Justin Dyer and myself, as we discuss some of our clients' most pressing financial questions. This is AWM Insights, and let's dive right in. Well, Justin, welcome back. We're going to you know, jump into this next little series here, I think, and uh, hotly uh, contested debate um, that is shouldn't be hotly contested, I <laughs> yeah, think. I was just going to say that. But man. it still is. Uh, nonetheless, I think this is the the dark underbelly of our industry, unfortunately, because uh, sometimes just what seems intuitive on the surface doesn't necessarily pen its way out. But what are we talking about? We're talking about market timing, active trading, stock picking. What is the most successful way to actually invest your portfolio? Indexing, you know, all these things are so I think complicated. Um, you know, we we cut through some of the noise previously. You know, not every mutual fund is actively traded anymore. Not every ETF is indexed uh, or passively indexed anymore. Uh, so there's lots of nuance, but I know that's where we're going to start to today, Justin, by just throwing out some definitions, laying the groundwork. So I'd love to hear from you. Just yeah, maybe you can give some clarity around here to, you know, when people refer to active, what does that mean? When they refer to passive, what does that mean? And how can we start to frame our thinking about what successful investing is? Sure. So we'll start with these black and white definitions with the disclaimer that this is the the world is not black and white as we all know there's a spectrum and and flavors and all that stuff but we have to start somewhere we always like to think first principles let's let's go there and 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 to your point Brandon let's start with definitions so i think the simplest way of, of framing this conversation uh with respect to active investing are those are in, investors who are trying to beat a benchmark I mean, quite simply, uh, there's probably more you can add to that, but I think at the at the heart of it is they are trying through their own intellectual uh, capabilities, through their skill, their believed skill, to outperform an index. What is an index? An index is a, a defined uh, collection of stocks that is uh, there to try and represent a, a specific um, component or part of the stock market. So the common indexes or benchmarks out there are the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That index has been around for probably almost 100 years. It is the top 30 industrial companies that trade on the market. That is that is it. And there's a definition of, around what you know what that that what what companies need to um, fulfill to actually be added to the Dow or or subtracted or eliminated from the Dow. Another big one, S and P five hundred. That one's even easier. It's the top five hundred largest names in the U S stock market. There are some definitions and criteria that you have to meet to get in or out of it, but in general, it's the five hundred largest companies. Another big one you hear about is the Nasdaq um, and or the Nasdaq one hundred more specifically, which are the hundred largest uh, stocks on the Nasdaq stock exchange. And so, an, a common active the managed strategy, mutual fund, ETF, or just somebody who's trying to do uh, some investment management on their own. Um, naturally, if, if you're trying to, to to do something on your own and and um, and get a good result, you you need to compare yourself to something to ask answer the question. Hey, am I am I actually adding value? Is this a good use of my time? Can I actually buy and sell stocks and outperform the S and P five hundred, or can I just should I just go buy an index? You can't actually buy an index, but you can buy products that are ETFs or mutual funds that are designed to essentially mimic the S and P five hundred. We'll use that probably as the most common. Um, index out there. It's just most commonly quoted. It's very familiar to everybody and it's easy to define. Um, whereas, so th th those people who are buying those indexes are just saying those are passive investors. Those are indexed based investors. They, they say, hey, this rule based approach to investing makes sense. Uh, I just want exposure. I want to hold those top 500 stocks and, and then I'm going to go focus my time elsewhere. 
Um, we'll get into what the data actually shows as to uh, which route you probably should take. Um, and you know, maybe listening to this podcast, you can probably um, you can probably pick up on on where where this is going. But I will I'll, I'll say this and then stop here, and we can we can go deeper as, as you want. Brandon is it's a nuanced. It, it, there is some nuance to this, right? Like I said, not everything is black and white in order to have conversations and to start the debate and to, to start to analyze something, you do have to ask some pretty simple questions. And, and, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to do today. Yeah, no, I think that was a great summary, Justin. And, you know, like I mentioned, we're going to get deeper over the coming weeks and, and eventually we'll get to what's the actual evidence say and where, where should you invest? But I think along those, you know, to, to be able to get there, it, we need to start to dispel some of the, some of the myths or the sales, the sales pitches that are out there, for instance, you know, really picking on stock picking. Let's let's tear that apart a little bit today. And I'd love to, you know, there's a, a famous report uh, that gets put out regularly called the SPIVA, really compares the S&P. So that index performance you just uh, referred to, but against, you know, these active managers, these these people that believe they can read the tea leaves. They kind of know where things are going. Um, they're going to underweight, overweight, pick certain stocks. They're going to, you know, really kind of put all that together. Maybe some market timing to that aspect. But maybe that's where we hone in here, Justin. I'd love you even just to unpack this Beaver report a little bit. Um, you know, it it pretty consistently shows that there can't be outperformance, yet we continually have people that think they can do it. Um, so I'd love for you to just, yeah, why don't you dig in there a little bit and help us to understand like what, what is it about stock picking that makes that really difficult to, to really, if you look at the evidence impossible to consistently, and that's a key word, consistently beat the market. Yeah. And it, I mean, it is amazing that such a treasure trove of data is out there and often goes overlooked. And I shouldn't say overlooked. I mean, when, when the reports come out, I think they come out every six months or so, um, there's a handful of articles around it, but often, you know, it's a single news cycle and then everyone moves on and we all forget about it. But it is, it's an incredibly robust report set of data that is there. Just type in SPIVA into a a, um, a Google Chrome uh, browser and, and it will pop right up. And S, just to expand on it, S&P stand, or SPIVA stands for S&P Index versus Active Report. And essentially what it does is it goes and takes all the standard and poor's indexes, uh, which there's many, it's not just the S&P 500, S&P 500 is the most prominent. It takes all of their benchmarks, their indices, I'll use those terms interchangeably, and it just compares it to the, the, the data set of actively managed funds in the marketplace and says, okay, how many of these funds, these, these managed funds have outperformed? How many have underperformed? It looks at various time periods. It looks at the trailing one year. It looks at trailing three, five, 10. And then further to that, Brandon, to your point, it also says, okay, well, you know, often there's a little sliver. Uh, it's a very small sliver that does outperform. Is that same group persistent? year in and year out, meaning does the same group of people that outperform, do they outperform in, in subsequent years, two, three, four years down the road? Answer is very, very few do. And so just to put some statistics, I'm not going to go too much into it, but uh, the most recent report was just released for 2021, calendar year 2021. And kind of the headline here, and to Brandon, your point as well, I mean, these these the general trends apply across the board, whether you're talking about fixed income, you're talking about large caps, you're talking about small caps. There are some differences, but in general, these these same kind of conclusions can apply. So within the large cap stock arena, this is the S&P 500, the 500 largest stocks. There are a lot of managers who are trying to uh, participate and outperform. 85%, 85.07 to be specific, underperformed the S&P 500. 85% of managers underperformed over the last year through December 31st. Over five years, it was 74%. Over a 10-year period, it was 83%. You do get some anomalies uh, in any one year, but those longer-term numbers are incredibly consistent across the board. One of those anomalies, I'll, I'll show you, large-cap value last year versus the S&P 500 value. 
actually almost uh, or better than almost 40% uh, or excuse me, 38% underperformed. So almost or a little over 60% outperformed, which is really, really good for a, a given year. Um, it's, all, it's almost a coin flip though. So I'm, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt here. Uh, but the persistent co- persistence question has to come back into play and, and it just isn't there. The numbers revert over the long term to you know, 80% underperforming and those that outperform don't continuously show up there. So that's the, the nitty gritty data. Um, and then we can get into kind of the why too, because I think that's important. I think that's a the great question. You know, one thing I heard here when you're, you know, reciting those statistics and and I'll be honest, early in my career, I used to think, well, shoot, Justin, I mean, you just told me 68% in in the current calendar year, current year outperformed and even if I go out 10 years, you know, 87% underperformed, but there's still 13% that outperformed over 10 years and so you know, I used to go through the the mental exercise, and I think a lot of people maybe are if they're listening to this. Is that's great? So let's go find the thirteen percent. You know, let's go find these these managers, and that's where we should invest. That's you know ultimately why we're part of why we're paying you. Like let's let's go find them. It, but at the end of the day, I think, and you can give some more color to this. I can tell from my experience and and really studying the industry beyond that is. Unfortunately, what you're saying is the persistence, uh, there are no qualities that allow you to identify uh, those those people that do outperform over the 10-year period. And like you said, I mean, if you wanted to play the game of trying to pick a manager in the one year, and then you're going to try to flip to the manager the next year, I think we start to get into these reasons why it becomes so difficult, right? It's It's the cost of trading, it's the fees, it's the taxes, it's it's all of those things. So maybe unpack that. I mean, give me your two cents. You know, why why can't we just go find the 13% that outperform? Well, f- I would first of all say that, that those are terrible <laughs> odds. I mean, that's, you can go I to know, Vegas but and I get ask better. I question. <laughs> no, totally. But you can go to Vegas and get better odds of, of you know, winning essentially uh, in, in, at the craps table. Um, now, be careful where you play on the craps table. But anyway, um, you know, it, it's a totally valid question. Like, like you said, it, it's a good question to ask. But it, it's. I would say, well, a. I would say that those aren't very good odds. But okay, if you want to really, you know, challenge yourself and and do it, I think that the next question, and you alluded to it, is okay. What are the discerning characteristics of these individuals, and and is that something we can extract from the data, and and really. Time and time again, the, the the data in the public markets, we should have underscored this at the very outset, this is public market investing. The data shows that there is no discerning characteristics that say if you're outperforming in, in one year, you're likely to outperform in, in the next year. Um, you know, it's kind of called the hot hands manager, if you will. And it, there, those those managers are just incredibly fleeting, and so if you're playing that game, you your odds start to diminish even more. So okay, maybe you say I want to find that thirteen percent or the the top quartile, and then you're like, okay, well I need to find of that subset, I need to find those that are going to outperform, you know, two, three, four years down the road. I would argue that's actually a terrible time frame to to play around with. With you want to buy something and hold it for 10, 15, 20 years. And that makes the numbers even worse. Because to your point, often what doesn't even show up in these numbers are these frictional ancillary costs like taxes. So these active managers, not only are they bad at picking stocks that outperform the SP 500, they're doing it in a way that introduces more tax hurdles or tax drags in the portfolio and and those don't show up in these statistics there's no you can i mean you can back into it roughly but there's no specific after tax rate of return that's specific to each and every investor and guess what active managers are incredibly tax inefficient and so there's this huge drag there as well now I will say this isn't this isn't like bashing act stock pickers. I, I, there are incredibly intelligent people that are doing this, and that's part of why that this is an efficient or relatively efficient market. There are so many intelligent people competing against each other, and it makes the market work 
incredibly well. And guess what? If you're smart enough to, to just kind of look at the data and take this all in, you actually are benefiting from that. And, and, and that's kind of the, the mental uh, perspective change that, that we take and that, that we really want to underscore. And I hope, hope really, um, uh, get through people's heads with this podcast is that invest markets are incredible. They're, they're powerful. Long-term investing, compound interest, all these cool buzzwords are incredible. But don't play this silly game of trying to chase your tail, outperform the S&P 500 by, you know, whatever it is uh, each and every year. You can actually take a step back and invest in a very thoughtful way, which we'll get into, and and actually hopefully still outperform the market slightly through a, a you know being tax aware, controlling what you can control, and actually have a better outcome over the long term. So um, it's not to say that there's a bunch of dumb people out there doing this. It's it's actually the complete opposite. There's a bunch of incredibly intelligent people out there that are doing this, but they're all doing it against each other. And, and it kind of makes for this really uh, efficient marketplace overall. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And hopefully we gave a good sense today. And we're going to, like you said, Justin, we're going to go deeper. Uh, we're going to get to, okay, given all of this, I know that picking stocks probably isn't the right way for, for most. If people want to be successful investors, let's face it, you're not going to go pick stocks. Probably not going to try to time markets. We didn't get into that too much today, but we're going to in a in an upcoming episode. Um, and if you're going to, you know, kind of cut to the punchline, if we're going to be successful investors, what we're actually going to look at is the evidence, and the evidence shows that you do want to take an indexed approach. Now, there are certain areas in the market that do outperform over time, and so it's not purely a strict passive play. Um, that's that's also not the best way to go about investing. Uh, for most people, but for some, it it might be okay. So we'll get into future episodes. We're going to get into what does it mean to be a passive investor? What are you accepting when you do that? To what what if I'm an indexed investor, but using the evidence, and what can I expect from that? So um, we hope hope this was helpful, just laying the the foundation for kind of this world, these big broad terms of active, passive, indexed market timing, stock picker, et cetera. It's a whole alphabet soup we'll try to work through in the next you know few weeks. But um, also, as you know, uh, if you've been listening before we close out here, shoot me a text. Um, we're, we're building up you know, kind of this uh, database for you guys to be able to communicate back and forth with me. Uh, get us some. So we've had some really good suggestions for episodes. We had the Ukraine episode. We had the NFT. Those all came as inbound subjects from the community here. So we'd love for you to join the AWM Insights community. Um, shoot me a text. That number is 602-704-5574. Again, it's 602-704-5574. It'll come right to me. I'll respond, I promise. Um, and please, yeah, give us give us a suggestion for a future episode. At least throw the word insights or the little light bulb emoji in there. We're going to be giving out swag and stuff like that. So come join us in, the, in that community, and we look forward to uh, staying in touch with you through that. But until next time, own your wealth, make an impact, and always be a pro. The information in this podcast is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.